Hi everybody and welcome to another episode of Coronavirus TV. My name is Michael Haydock, I'm an infectious disease analyst at Informa Pharma Intelligence and I thought today that I'd talk you through a drug called Randesivir. If you hadn't heard of Randesivir before this week, you probably have now. It had uh, three different studies being reported on Wednesday. Uh, it's a small molecule antiviral being developed by a US biotech company called Gilead Sciences. Uh, and the data were mixed really. There was one trial that was very positive and is likely in my view, to lead to its approval, uh, reasonably imminently within the US. The second trial um, was uh, negative, it was from a Chinese trial, um, and unfortunately it did fail, but there are caveats with that that I'll get onto later. And then the third trial was quite frankly largely uninterpretable because of a poor study design, and I guess we can start with that one. Um, it was called the Simple Study. It's a study uh, that Gilead uh, itself had actually sponsored, and it investigated remdesivir either in a five day or a 10 day treatment course against uh, placebo. And that was in severe hospitalized COVID-19 patients. But importantly, and I'll come on to this a bit later on, um, it did exclude patients who were on baseline mechanical ventilation. And it is well established now that mechanical, uh, mechanical ventilation is a very poor marker of prognosis and mortality rates are much, much higher if you include those patients in your trials. So. Uh, this study was called simple. Unfortunately, it was both simple by name and also simple by nature in that it didn't include um, a placebo comparator arm, um, which is a real issue for infections like COVID-19 or any acute infections in general that are self-resolving because over time, naturally, patients will recover and that makes it very difficult, virtually impossible, unless you have some other historical uh, control to compare to, to actually interpret whether the drug showed signs of efficacy or not at all because uh, you effectively have nothing to compare it to. Um, so for those of you who might be interested in the numbers, 65% um, um, of patients treated uh, with uh, remdesivir in a five-day arm, which seemed to be the better arm of the two, um, showed uh, clinical recovery by day 14, and 60% of patients were able to be discharged at day 14, which seems reasonably positive. But as I say, there, there's no uh, clear-cut way to compare it to anything. In terms of mortality, uh, the mortality rate in the, in the uh, five-day arm was 8%, which again seems reasonably low, but uh, we need something to compare it to. So the closest thing we could probably compare it to was, uh, there's some data, as many of you know, New York City is particularly badly affected, I believe it's the worstly, uh, worst affected city in the world. And they've been uh, releasing some statistics on outcomes for patients in their hospitals. So there's a study published uh, about a week or two ago uh, from New York City, of 5,700 patients uh, who had been hospitalized in COVID. And I think they had outcomes data for about 2,400 of those. And they found that the uh, mortality rate in those patients was about 21%. Um, and if you compare that to the simple study that had 8%, on the face of it, that might, might seem very promising because of course the simple mortality rate is quite a lot lower. However, what you need to bear in mind, going back to that caveat that I mentioned at the start, is that simple excluded patients who are on mechanical ventilation. And if you try and take that data out of the New York City data, um, the mortality rate drops to just under 12%. So you're looking at about 12% versus 8%, or if you were to include all the remdesivir patients in this simple study, not just those on the, on the five-day arm, it goes to just over 9%. So it's a lot closer there. And even that, to be honest, isn't the best comparison because uh, while we could exclude people who received mechanical ventilation in the New York data, which will get you a little bit closer, that's still not exactly the same because the simple study only excluded patients on ventilation at baseline, didn't exclude obviously patients who might have progressed to need a ventilator during the course of treatment. So it's not an ideal comparison, but that really just highlights the point that you can't really interpret the data. So what can we actually interpret from this study? Well, the first on, on the positive side is certainly that the five day treatment course was at least non inferior. It actually performed numerically better than the 10 day treatment course. And that's good news for Gilead and it's good news for the world in general if this drug is approved, because with a shorter treatment course, you can treat more patients and there is going to be a limited supply of this drug throughout 2020, possibly even into early 2021 if cases are still high by that point. Hopefully not, but we'll see. Um, so it's good news that a five day course seems to be as effective. Um, it's likely that the, the reason the 10 day course was slightly less effective is because more patients discontinued due to uh, side effects in that, in that treatment arm. So that's some good news. 
On the downside related to side effects, there was a safety signal that is slightly concerning. I don't think it would be enough to prevent approval, but it is something that will be need, need to be monitored going forward because about 7% of patients in the simple trial had what's called grade three uh, hepatic adverse events, which is considered severe. So a severe adverse event in terms of um, uh, enzyme called ALT, which is just the marker of liver damage. So they had severe elevations in that and about 3% discontinued due to um, adverse events. So that will need to be monitored. Hepatic signals can be quite a severe signal. Um, so I'm sure that will be monitored in future studies, but overall positive in the sense that we have five day. Uh, of course, that seems to be effective in five days. The next study, which is much better study and, and led really to um, the expectations that this drug will be approved, was a study that was actually conducted by the US government, uh, National Institute of Health, specifically uh, NIH, the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. And this study, uh, much better study design, it was double blinded, um, it was randomized and it was placebo controlled. That's the most important thing. And it compared remdesivir um, against placebo in just over a thousand patients, 1,063 if I remember rightly, um, whereas the simple study was about 400 or so patients. Uh, so it's a much larger study, better powered and just better designed in general. And the really positive outcome from this, which is likely to lead to the approval of the drug in the US, is that um, it significantly reduced the time to improvement compared to placebo. So it's about 31% improvement, so 11 days me, uh, median time to improvement from, from the start of treatment for remdesivir compared to 15 days in placebo. So that's certainly positive, it is of course relatively modest improvement, but given we have no effective um, treatments, it's certainly a positive outcome. And then also importantly on the mortality statistics, there was a numerical trend in favour of remdesivir. So uh, the remdesivir arm, I believe, was um, about 8% mortality compared to, I think it was 11.7 in the control arm. So that just narrowly failed to reach clinical, uh, sorry, statistical significance. Um, it's uh, 0.059, so 5.9% chance that uh, probability that those results are due to chance. And for those of you not particularly uh, comfortable with statistics, the usual cutoff is 5%. Uh, so if you can say with confidence that uh, your results that you observed are less than 5% chance that they were a fluke, um, then it's considered statistically significant. So this was 5.9%, so it very narrowly missed that. But these were preliminary data. It was quite unusual in how these data released. They weren't through peer review. They were just announced uh, by the National Institute of Health. Uh, very top level data. So maybe if more patients begin to be included in analysis, we'll see that start to reach significance. Or if other studies are pooled with this data and just more studies are being conducted. So maybe we'll see that teased down into significance going forward, but certainly positive data. Um, there were no data on safety released, which again, as I mentioned before, will be something to watch, particularly with regards to hepatotoxicity, but that's uh, worth noting in future studies. But overall, it was a very positive response. The markets rose, Gilead share price rose, and actually uh, Anthony Fauci, who is the uh, director of NIAID, actually, uh, some would say preemptively, but he said that he expects it to become the next standard of care. And certainly, assuming now other drugs can show benefit, I'm sure it will do if it is eventually approved. So, uh, lots of hope that this drug will eventually get approved in the US. Uh, some questions still remain with regards to that trial, some bits of data points that we'd like to see teased out, particularly um, how did, so the, uh, the government study included both moderate and severe patients, so it'd be interesting to see if there was any sort of efficacy difference between those populations. Um, and also, uh, one of the big questions is how early should we be treating people? Uh, the obvious answer is probably early is better, and there's some data su to suggest that's the case. But it'd be interesting to see whether efficacy differed significantly um, based on the number of days that people have been symptomatic before they actually receive treatment. So that will be interesting to watch as well. So that's the second study. And then the third one, uh, which has caveats of its own, it was a Chinese study. And this one was a much more negative outcome, but has generally been paid less attention because it was less powered. There are some issues with the study. So I'll go into that one next. Uh, so this was a study that was based in, in Wuhan, the, the epicenter of the outbreak. It included, well, originally included, or hoped to include around 450 or so patients. It ended up including, I think it's about 237. They had to terminate it early, um, effectively, because they, they were running out of patients. The epidemic had largely subsided in the city while this trial um, was being conducted, so they didn't have enough patients that they could recruit. Um, so it was underpowered, as I say, roughly half the number of patients that they intended to recruit. 
Um, and they also measured in uh, hospitalized patients, they looked at the median time to clinical improvement. And sadly, they didn't see an improvement in, with remdesivir compared to uh, their best support, uh, supportive care arm, either in the uh, time to improvement or in the mortality statistics. So the mortality was 14% for remdesivir versus 13% for placebo, so no clear trend there. And secondly, um, we also saw that there was no um, well, there was a numerical trend in terms of remdesivir favoring remdesivir for clinical improvement, but it wasn't enough to reach statistical significance. So the outcome of that means that trial failed. Uh, so that um, had previously um, dampened expectations because the preliminary data were released a couple of weeks ago for that, and it was published on the same day as the positive data from the NIH study. So something to dampen the tone a little bit, some caveats there, but uh, as I say, it was less powered uh, than the US study. So generally, the, the uh, the preference has been to interpret the US study over the Chinese one. So they're the three studies as a whole. Hopefully that's clarified things a little bit, uh, giving you an idea of some of the uh, key takeaways. Um, but just to summarise, um, there are still some questions to be answered, particularly regarding what's the sweet spot regarding when patients should be treated and is there a limit by which the drug's no longer effective? Um, is the drug going to be effective in moderate and severe patients equally, or will there be a, a kind of biased efficacy towards one group? And uh, lastly, uh, the safety issue. So we'll need to monitor that going forwards, um, but it's overall very positive news. It looks like it's going to be approved very soon in the US, and hopefully approvals in other regions will follow on from that reasonably quickly. So I hope that's been very useful for you. Uh, thank you for listening. I'm sure there'll be many more podcasts uh, coming up, but uh, I hope you have a great day. And thanks again for listening.